Welcome to the Vernon Hills Update. The update offers information about a variety of village services. You'll meet a few of your neighbors and you'll find out about upcoming events. On today's show, we'll sit down with Lake County Board Chair Aaron Lawler for a State of the County review, including a look at the Lake County budget as well as such initiatives as the Mental Health Commission, the Government Reform Commission, and local government consolidation. We'll introduce a terrific way to recycle your old cell phones while supporting our troops through the village's Cell Phones for Soldiers program. We'll touch base with the Vernon Hills Police Department as we review suggestions for keeping you and your belongings safe this holiday shopping season. We'll stop by Countryside Fire to review some important safety tips when it comes to your holiday decorations. And we'll enjoy some of the sights and sounds of this year's Village Tree and Menorah Lighting, which was held November 25th at the Vernon Hills Golf Course. Thank you for tuning in to the Vernon Hills Update. We are here to talk about everything Lake County, and who better to help us than Aaron Lawler. He's our 18th District Representative from the Vernon Hills area to the Lake County Board, and he also happens to be the Lake County Board Chairman and a longtime Vernon Hills resident, so he's our go-to guy when we talk Lake County, so thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Well, and we like to do this about once a year when, when the Lake County budget starts coming together and getting ready, that's when we like to talk to you, so I know it's a busy time. But thanks for kind of, one of the things we'll go over here today is the budget and what sure. all that's about, so thanks. Um, and before we start, we were talking before we started rolling the camera, sometimes a little civics lesson is in order because there are so many different government entities. You've got municipalities such as Vernon Hills, you've mm -hmm. got school districts and park districts and all these other things. The county is kind of the amalgamation of all of the municipalities in Lake County, which is pretty far-reaching and pretty diverse. So we have 230 units of government in Lake County, of which you know the county is one. We have 52 municipalities. Uh, we have upwards of, I think, 15 or 16 library districts. We have park districts, 18 yeah. townships, and all of these appointed entities. So it is a lot for folks to wrap their head around. Yeah, it is. It is. So, um, and when we talk about Lake County, sometimes you forget it, it goes all the way to Lake Cook Road, which is Cook mm -hmm. County starts. You go all the way to Wisconsin, all the way out into, is it the McHenry area? How far west do you so have to go? Fox Lake, Volo, Wakanda, okay. Okay. Barrington. So you've got some kind of rural areas. You've got some very urban areas. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot of industry. You've got kind of a mix here in Lake County. It's really an engine for the state. Uh, we are. I think we're a microcosm of the state. Okay. We uh, have 12 Fortune 500 headquarters, which we're very proud of. Uh, Caterpillar has moved here uh, okay. this fall. That's a big get for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're also a very diverse uh, community, a lot more diverse than I think people uh, think in Lake County. We're 20 percent Latino. Uh, we're about 7 uh, percent Asian. Right here in Vernon Hills, we're I think 19 percent Asian. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually 38 percent of our neighbors are foreign born, which is the highest percentage out of any community in Lake County. In Vernon Hills. That's right the, here. Yeah. Yeah. We, we are very diverse. It's really exciting to get to know all those cultures and everything like that. When we talk to um, how, how Lake County goes, how our municipalities in Lake County go, it's, it, it, what we, we want good for everybody. So if mm -hmm. it's good in Vernon Hills, it's good for everybody. Similarly, if it's good actually even across the border in Wisconsin, that's not always, it's not a win-lose. It can be a win-win for us. I, I think so. You look at things like this Foxconn deal, which people may or may not be aware of, where uh, the state of Wisconsin is offering them buku incentives, <laughs> you know, billions of dollars billions. In, of incentives. <laughs> we actually benefit from things like that because our workforce is second to none, and mm -hmm. they're able to go and work at these companies, mm -hmm. whether they're in Kenosha or Cook County, um, mm -hmm. Amazon is another example. Whether or not Amazon uh, picks Lake County or another area in Chicagoland, we want this to be a win for the region, and mm -hmm. that's going to benefit our workers and our people. And when we talk too about, um, we talk about Lake County government, and I know you're responsible for a lot of services. You're responsible for the Lake County Forest Preserve. There's, a, there's mm -hmm. a lot. We'll kind of, we'll kind of parcel that out as we go. Um, but what's interesting is you also work kind of like you work to benefit each municipality. So what mm -hmm. we've talked about, what's good in Wisconsin, what's good in Cook County is good for us here. And it seems to be a really nonpartisan kind of a, a, a it's not what we see when we see Cook County working and mm -hmm. we see that on the news. It doesn't seem like they're working as much. When we see Springfield, it seems like more bipartisanship. When we see Washington, people take sides of the aisle. But you can't really tell for, for Lake County government 
Who's mm -hmm. backing what? They just want for the good of the order. Well, first, we don't have the authority to levy a, a soda tax, so that okay. makes things <laughs> a little easier. But when you break down county government, we have eight countywide elected mm -hmm. officials, uh, the sheriff, the treasurer, the circuit court clerk, the county clerk, the recorder of deeds, the regional superintendent of schools, the coroner, and I'm probably missing one. <laughs> um, but then there are also 21 different board members that each represent about 35,000 people. Um, so that's where we, we really draw from a wealth of knowledge of a lot of different folks that mm -hmm. serve on the county board um, from different professions mm -hmm. and different communities. And I think that makes us better uh, as a board. Uh, but we have built a, a bipartisan culture mm -hmm. where we are, you know, we put people in positions of leadership, uh, whether it's committee chairs or other things, based on their skill set and who's going to be able to bring mm -hmm. the most to the table, not necessarily what their party label is. Uh, and so that's something we're very proud of. Well, and, and it does always appear that when it comes to Lake County, the budget gets done. We mm -hmm. aren't hearing things like soda taxes and, and we're shutting down Chicago public schools, things like that that happens in Cook County. Um, but you do have a lot of services you have to keep track of. I mm -hmm. mean, you just named, you know, the courts and the state's attorney, um, but you, you've, you, and the elections, uh, but even just the, some of the roadways and the public works, and there's just a lot of different departments that are, we, we kind of almost don't pay attention to them. Sure. Um, but they're there doing work on our behalf. Yeah, so. so I mean, people forget that we fund the circuit court and everything that goes along with it, from the state's attorneys, the public defender, uh, the sheriff and the jail, um, these are, are big expenses, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but they're also state-mandated expenses. So mm -hmm. about a third of our budget goes to courts and public safety. Mm -hmm. About uh, you know, 20, um, 28, 30 percent goes to the health department, uh, where we serve 50,000 of our 700,000 residents in w one way or another uh, through our primary care division. And every Lake County restaurant people eat at or health fitness center that they go to is inspected by mm -hmm. our folks to make sure that it's safe. And then there's roads and infrastructure th mm -hmm. that you mentioned. That's another about 30 percent of the budget. So really, you know, 90 percent of the budget is going to those three areas. Well, and when you talk too about, uh, you mentioned like you forget about the health department and all the doctors and personnel and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like it seems like that should be a bigger percentage uh, of, of, of how you allocate, but mm -hmm. when we were talking before, you said that's where a lot of times you go for a lot of grants and you try to get everything covered as much as you can. Yes, yeah, so for every $1 we budget uh, for the health department in property taxes, um, they leverage $2 in grants or other reimbursable payments. And so we're really good at getting grants and making sure that we're finding alternatives and other sources of revenue uh, so that we're alleviating that burden where we can. A lot of, th a lot of times with our budget, uh, you know, it is a large budget because we have a lot of mandated responsibilities, but people forget uh, that we only keep seven cents on every uh, dollar that they pay in property taxes. Okay. So 93 percent of what folks pay in property taxes, we take in because they pay it to the county, but that's immediately pushed right back out the door to those 230 other units of okay. government well, school is getting the biggest piece. So, so it goes into you, and then you parcel it back out to mm -hmm. the percentages. And like you said, schools, education, that is really, if you look in your property tax bill, mm -hmm. um, and, and it, I'm always remiss if I don't say, and Vernon Hills, the village of Vernon Hills collects no property tax. Yep. So we always like to remember that because we run on that sales tax that's generated here, why, it's, why we always say shop in town. So exactly. that's the message we always have to put it's out important. there. So yeah. And that's, and that's very unique for, for Lake County. Well, so there's so much going on. Um, and when we talk about economics, you guys got the budget put together really quickly, and it's balanced. Mm -hmm. and, and you're doing it not without um, constraints, because my thoughts is Springfield and the state is still not, not kind of participating in the way in years sure. past they would have. Uh, you know, and actually they're taking revenues that we otherwise relied on. One thing that we um, rely on for our transportation budget is the quarter percent uh, sales tax for transportation and public safety. It was put in place about eight years ago and we invest a hundred percent of what we collect in that in that sales tax mm -hmm. back into Lake County roads. The state's now uh, collecting 2% as a collection fee. It's kind of like one of those nagging ATM fees that we all hate. <laughs> 
um, <laughs> that they're 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 taking that in order to collect um, our sales tax revenue on our behalf. So so it has to go to them to collect that portion, and they're mm -hmm. just not releasing it all back. They're keeping Correct. a portion back for their. They're taking effort. two for, two for, two percent off of. Um, you know our budget like I discussed yeah. as well as the sales tax that you mentioned that's generated here locally in town So the same thing happens to the village. Yeah, so, so for us It's $700,000 that would have otherwise gone into local roads, roads and that's things being sent on a one-way trip to Springfield Oh my goodness. So and when you think about the roads too, there are so many improvement projects and I know the county has It, it takes a long time for a road project to mm -hmm. get through IDOT and all the approvals and all the engineering and everything but then on top of it, if, if funding's not there, it's like everything's a dead end. So I know that the county has stepped in and kind of, mm -hmm. kind of lit the fire under some projects. So uh, 21 and 137, people remember that going on for a long time. We paid for that project. The state managed it. Uh, we just opened uh, the Washington Street underpass in Grays mm -hmm. Lake, which uh, grade separates uh, the railroad traffic from Huge. the motorist traffic. Um, that's a big project, but each of these does cost a lot of money, and so we do need funding. The state has reduced uh, the amount of money that IDOT is spending in Lake County on state roads by $32 million this year as a part of a over $300 million cut statewide. So, so not only does the state reduce IDOT, mm -hmm. and then the state reduces the money you had to put into the roads, mm -hmm. and the state reduces the money coming back to Vernon Hills for improvement, so it just it keeps rolling downhill, and it's it? it's a big problem because when you look statewide at our transportation system, um, there is a day of reckoning coming. And I hate to be that doom and gloom person yeah. on this, but um, the state of good repair costs just to keep the current trains and buses running on the current schedules for our transit system is thirty billion dollars. Mm. It's twenty five billion dollars for our roads, and so we simply are not investing enough money into our infrastructure. And that has an impact on our economy. Mm -hmm. Well, especially as you talked about, it's important for our highly trained workforce that's here mm -hmm. in Lake County to be able to move around where they need to so they can get to the jobs and then get back home at the end of the day and not be on the road for all exactly. you know, for all time. So, yep. Well, that's kind of disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not the great news. But, no. but, but really, the county does, even in spite of all this, again, um, when I look through all the budget documents, a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. So can we talk a little bit about... Um, you know the process you guys you know have all the different uh, entities that you have to fund and mm -hmm. keep track of and you were able to come up with a balanced budget that uh, still d gets a lot of good work done we do you know and so uh, we focus on that and we also are really focusing on uh, our strategic priorities and in Lake County I believe that when you look at our strategic plan a lot of people will get bored with a, a document <laughs> like that but it all comes down to investing in our people and our communities mm -hmm. and so that's how we're investing in our workforce Mm -hmm. uh, and also when people are in a time of need, like those that are struggling with mental health. Okay, yeah, and that's, that's one of the big, we've, we talked about this before, what, with the, the health department and the health initiatives, that the mental health um, continuum of care has to be funded, mm -hmm. and we have to work on that as a community. So um, you've got a commission that's been working together, I understand. Yes, so we have a mental health uh, coalition that's been working. I appointed former state senator Susan Garrett to co-chair it with me. Um, it's an area that I'm incredibly passionate about because I believe that it is uh, the number one moral imperative that our leaders have the ability to really make a difference in. Um, I was invited uh, and will be attending a conference uh, and speaking at it by the mayor of New York, uh, Mayor de Blasio. I'm very proud of that opportunity, but it, it speaks to uh, the progress that we're making and how we share information. And it all kind of came to bear uh, when we were doing our uh, homeless survey one winter, a couple winters ago, and I met a guy named Terrence uh, in the Vista West ER, uh, which now will be uh, the U.S. Health Vest Mental Health mm -hmm. Hospital. Uh, and he was 33. I was 33 at the time. Uh, he was bipolar. Um, he was addicted to drugs, and he was homeless for the first time. And yet he couldn't get in to see a psychiatrist for three months. Mm -hmm. And I really thought, how can we expect Terrence to stay housed and employed mm -hmm. and get where he needs to go mm -hmm. without having an episode if we can't give him uh, a, a psychiatric appointment mm -hmm. for three months. Mm -hmm. And so that's where a lot of this began and my passion for it. Well, and we talk about too, you, you, we talked about the stakeholders involved in a continuum of care, and you mentioned communication, and that's key because mm -hmm. they're, they're, to get the resources connected 
and, and have it make sense and not and, and one thing leads to another homelessness and in you know mental health issues and addiction they all kind of one feeds the other yeah so. and when we're not effectively coordinating that continuum like mm -hmm. you mentioned they are ending up in one of three places it's in our ERs our jails or homeless on our streets mm -hmm. none of those are good options we've got a national shortage of psychiatrists uh, we mm -hmm. don't have enough permanent supportive housing mm -hmm. and we have the opportunity to take some of these folks that are in crisis and divert them from the uh, the jail that they don't belong right. in or the ERs that aren't serving them the mm -hmm. most effectively and put them in perhaps a crisis center. Um, mm -hmm. These are things that actually uh, tug on our heartstrings but right. also our wallets and, and there's an opportunity to provide better more humane care at a lower cost. Well right because when we talk about jail Jail isn't set up to provide those services, no. but yet such a high percentage of the people in our jails, actually what they need is the mental health. They Correct. don't really need to be locked up. They need the help, but there's no place to go, and it costs us a lot to lock yep. somebody up. Well over a third of the people in our jail are on a psych psychotropic medication, um, and you know that shows that they do have a mm -hmm. mental health issue, and it costs $46,000 a year to put somebody in Lake County Jail. Mm -hmm. Think about what you could do with that money, which is what you're doing. Yeah. You're trying to think about what you can do with that money so that it is more humane. It's, well, I, I'm glad you're going to New York and, yeah. and working with them and talking to them. And, and, and um, I'm sure we'll see more coming as this commission mm -hmm. continues to work. So like if somebody does need help, one of the places they can look to is the county then. Correct. And we're looking at the whole person. So it's not just the psychiatric service, but also mm -hmm. the College of Lake County is involved, our workforce department's yeah. involved. Um, the different housing agencies, so really trying to provide that whole person. Mm -hmm. One of the national models is called uh, finding somebody a bed, a buddy, and a job. Um, <laughs> sometimes those are some of the key right. things that folks yeah. need um, to get out of uh, a mental health challenge or right. perhaps a substance abuse issue. Well, and everybody wants to be able to take care of themselves, you mm -hmm. know, so you don't want to be in, in some of these emergency situations. So, yeah. well, well, we'll continue to, to talk with you about that please sure. update on us on that because it is important and it is groundbreaking and it is really um, like you said it's our, our moral mandate to, to do better mm -hmm. and so thank you for leading that and thank you to your commission for that another thing you talk about in in your budget consolidation because um, every time you can make a dollar go farther by you know putting things together you guys continue to work on that we we do and um, unfortunately um, there's just so many different lines on people's tax bills. Like I mentioned, <laughs> 230. Um, I appoint 330 folks to different boards and commissions. Uh, there are 24 different um, entities that I appoint that have taxing authority, okay. including your fire districts, uh, mosquito abatement, sanitary districts. I have one sanitary district in the northwest part of the county where every time a resident flushes their toilet, they pay four taxes and fees to three <laughs> different government bodies. It's ludicrous. Yeah. And so we're looking at how we do that. Uh, right here in Vernon Hills, we're looking at consolidating the CV drainage district or drainage ditch into each municipality that has yeah. taken care of it for years anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but that removes the ability for a property tax to be levied, um, you know, and, and it that's just important. cleans the books up, you know, right? It does. You know, so. It does. Well, and I know one of the things you talked about the 911 regional centers. Now, that's something that is kind of close to our heart here in Vernon Hills because we've already done a lot of consolidation. Yep. You know, they were kind of uh, leading edge how Countryside Fire and the police and everybody worked together. But you're looking to do that in other communities in Lake County. We need to because we have um, 20 different emergency telephone system boards that oversee 30 different dispatch centers. So Vernon Hills was a trailblazer on this with Libertyville and others mm -hmm. years ago. But if you compare us to Will County, Will County has one ETSB. We wow. have 20 emergency telephone system boards. They have six, soon to be three dispatch centers. Again, we have 30. Okay. So we're not running on an efficient model. We actually can provide better service um, with fewer call forwards so that when people right. call 911, they're not being put on hold. Right, um, right. And hopefully that also saves money. Okay. I would think that there might be, that might be a little harder than the CV ditch work because it is. There's, it's always close to people's hearts. And I know they always worry, well, if I don't have my dispatch that's in my town, I'm not mm -hmm. going to get the service. But in fact, the confusion that arises from just the multiple layers has to, has to be you know, brought into to exactly. and, it, and it also goes back to mental health because we're training dispatchers and uh, mm -hmm. police and how to respond to these, mm -hmm. you know, 21st century issues and, and mental mm -hmm. health 
uh, folks that are in crisis. Um, and so that having better, more uniform standards for training is important too. Right, you can, and you can train more in depth if you've got a smaller group and they can all get that same training. Yeah. Well, and I know that I think that when, when we're talking about the, and by the way, I don't think we said, we said that it's a balanced budget. Four hundred and thirty-seven million. Correct. Um, was pretty. It's pretty. It's pretty much it's, the same. Pretty yeah, flat. Yeah, it's from, about two percent up, but pretty okay. flat. Um, and it balances, so it's yes. not like you're hope you're hopeful. Even with the state kind of causing you problems, you're still balanced. So. We cut. You know, there are grant-funded positions that the state cut in the health department that we cut as a result. Um, so we realize that we have. Um, we have a job to do, but we also can't take on every time there's a yeah, cut in Springfield. Yeah. We can't absorb that. Well, and it seems like that's the every every fiscal period. That's what happens. It's just we're going to take a little bit more or give a little bit less back to you. So yeah. unfortunate. But well, and when we talk about um, you, you have done the cost cutting because I know before you've talked about accelerated retirement. When people you don't refill your your positions, mm -hmm. you're r running leaner and meaner as much as that you saved can. us nine million dollars mm -hmm. in. In salaries, I, I believe I'd have to double check, but it's it was millions of dollars. I think nine million dollars in salary savings overall by doing that in mm -hmm. the last year, and it's not by giving folks a golden parachute. It's a very <laughs> limited uh, package mm -hmm. that usually bridges health care costs for somebody Which that's is within. Key, yeah. Yeah. So if you're within a couple years of retirement, we'll pay for your health care costs, or there's a mm -hmm. commensurate cash package. But it's not giving somebody a big bloated it's, golden parachute. Yeah. It's parachute. not not like what you, what you think about sometimes with corporate America how that yeah. works out. So it's not a big buyout like that. Yeah. Well, and I saw things in the budget. You talked about cross department integration and shared services, and just that all those things to just make make the personnel and the the systems go as far as they can. So it's important. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the th we talked about the mental health is a is a huge part of the initiative, mm -hmm. local government consolidation. Uh, government Reform Commission, okay. that's something that you're, you know, continues to have a life in this budget. So what's that? So uh, it kind of came out of a, a, a proposed uh, state law um, that was, was vetoed by the governor that would require my position to be elected countywide. And um, it was proposed by uh, local state senator Terry Link, and I kind of responded by saying, you know, let's have that discussion, but let's go further and let's put a whole host of reforms forward for discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and so, not only has the reform commission studied the issue of having the uh, chairman elected countywide, but we're also looking at independent redistricting reform, which has kind of eluded the state mm -hmm. for a long time. There's and when a lot you of say that, that, mm -hmm. that means, it, 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 that mean redistricting mm -hmm. means how the, the lines are drawn. Correct. Okay. So every 10 years, thank you, because sometimes I, I get too technical, <laughs> but uh, every 10 years we have to redraw our county board uh, lines as well as our state legislative lines. Okay. Um, and basically what this proposal does is really takes it out of uh, the hands of, of politicians and elected officials. I drew the county board map in 2012. I know how the system works, and I know how it could work better. Uh, but really, it seeks to end the practice in Illinois of having politicians draw districts that pick their voters instead oh, okay. of allowing voters to really pick their elected officials. Okay, which is where, like, if a voter knows he's got a really good neighborhood over here, all of a sudden there's a little bubble in that, um, which I don't know that it happens, yeah. but that's that's it, the fear. It does, and that's the state law. Well, who, would, who would draw the lines, and what are your thoughts? Well, we're looking at it, and, and other states do it differently. Some states use, uh, you know, an automated a computer process, which kind of scares me a little bit to, you know, to do <laughs> just that. I'm thinking hanging chads and all that <laughs> stuff. I don't know. Yeah, so. and, and some folks have an independent commission, and so that's okay. where the reformed commission is really um, looking into these different models, and they're going to be making recommendations on how we can have a truly independent commission. A okay. local resident, Kathy Rigg, a former okay. state representative, yes. is the vice chair of the Reform Commission, and she's been leading a statewide effort on independent maps uh, for years, and so I'm really glad to draw from mm -hmm. her expertise. Well, so hopefully what we do here then can maybe roll into some other places. Well, and when we talk yeah. about the, um, uh, the your chairman role, just to, to clarify, Right now, how it is is everybody's voted for from their area. So we, as voters, say we want you, Aaron, mm -hmm. to do this role for us. And then the the county board has looked at everybody and said, Aaron, we think you're the one we'd like for chairman. And based on your experience and your, mm -hmm. you know, every and your background and everything else, so this would be different mm -hmm. potentially. Where then instead of voting. 
for you as a rep, you'd run either as a rep or you'd run, run as the chairman. Wide. Yeah. Okay. And and there's there's pluses and minuses to that. You know, voters sometimes want that direct ability mm -hmm. to elect their their county board chairman. Um, what we've seen though is that I'm the only chairman in the Chicago region that is not a former state legislator. Oh. A legislator and in fact every time this change has occurred the county has then elected a former legislator okay. I don't think that's the right direction yeah. um, it you know we have a triple A bond rating uh, we have very strong ethics rules mm -hmm. and you look at the counties that have made this change uh, one county has lost their triple A bond rating from one rating agency another is in a partisan run amok and others another county uh, the chairman has seen ethics investigations that no county has really mm -hmm. ever seen before except cook county um, and so i don't think there's a lot of good that comes out of it mm -hmm. um, but we'll see what the commission comes well, what, up with what's interesting is how we do it it would appear that it's part of that bipartisan nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. we just need to get the work done environment that lake county has it's like you figure out who's who's going to be good at the job who's going to work on yeah. our behalf who we can get along with we don't divide it down a line here or there and and you know everything has run very smoothly so. it fosters a lot more collaboration because every two years i have to go back to my colleagues and ask for them to put their mm -hmm. faith and trust in me and i have to get 11 votes to do it you mm -hmm. know and so mm -hmm. it does foster a lot more collaboration mm -hmm. um, than if somebody's maybe directly elected you also think about the money in politics yeah. that it brings into the system and the influence that that carries mm -hmm. with it well, and Lake County is a prime, it's a prime voting district. You know, yeah. everybody, you know, there's a lot going on. Like you said, there's a lot of, you know, movers and shakers here. And so, yeah. well, that's interesting. So, so Government Reform Commission, um, thank you to your, your people there working on that. And that sounds like something we'll be hearing more about as mm -hmm. they work through the options. And we can come back and talk about that at yeah. another time. So, um, we've talked about a lot of stuff here yeah and, I think what really you know kind of sums it all together whether it's mental health or the reform commission the consolidation stuff we really do kind of like you said want to be a model to help fix our mm -hmm. broken state we think that there's a lot of opportunity um, and Lake County does have a lot of that horsepower to be able to, right, right. to provide some thought leadership well and when you talk about thought leadership and getting involved as you said, you you in your position and the the rest of your Lake County board comrades and as well as just your your um, your personnel that are our staff, mm -hmm. you, there, there's a lot of connections. You know, you've mentioned College of Lake County. You've mentioned, you know, all these different uh, initiatives and task force. So it's one of those things that if somebody wants to get involved and make a difference, if if you know whether it's corporate and they want their corporation to be mm -hmm. have a bigger impact in maybe job training or something like that. This is the sort of stuff you like to hear about. Absolutely. So we have lots of different opportunities to serve um, for every um, area or um, profession or interest, mm -hmm. um, whether you are English speaking, whether it's Hispano mm -hmm. we want to get folks involved um, because it really helps, I think, lead to better outcomes when you have people with mm -hmm. different perspectives that are all contributing in their community. and. This is a time when people are so cynical about government <laughs> and about politics. Right. We want to show that there's opportunity and that we're a little bit different, right. or hopefully a lot different. Well, right, and, and the, the, some of the rhetoric we hear elsewhere is very divisive. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, when we, when we look at it in the municipal or the Lake County level, it's much more inclusive. It's a much more inclusive conversation. There's mm -hmm. a much more opportunities for everybody. And if somebody wants to find out more, I know you've got newsletters you send out you can yep. the website has so much great information and may i say your budget's actually quite interesting to read it's got <laughs> graphics and everything so people Thank you. really should look it over our communications office is smiling ear to ear because <laughs> i've looked at other county budgets and they are really boring <laughs> yeah. this um, is really good stuff it's really it, it's it's, and, it's yeah. really interesting just to look mm -hmm. even at all these huge corporations and the amount of employment they put into our community there's a lot of good so so take the time to go and look at that budget because yep. it's it's interesting you'll like it so cool. um, and so go to the website you can sign up for your e-newsletter as well absolutely and uh, you can always call the office email mm -hmm. me um, you know I was I'm gonna say your around. office is very uh, accessible so if somebody wants to talk to you it, it might take a little bit for you to get out of a meeting and get to somebody yep. but 
you get back to everybody and they I help do. they're very helpful so even don't don't even hesitate to give a call to your office they're wonderful. Help, so well thank you for taking the time I know we could talk literally for hours because we just scratched the surface yeah. um, but I do want everybody to know that you're available uh, more information is online and uh, we thank you for the work you're doing on our behalf we really appreciate it thank so. you it's a pleasure thank you We are at the Vernon Hills Police Station with Community Service Officer Lon Pulaski. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, Officer Pulaski, and hear about some of the programs you've got going for us. Thank you. And now we're thinking about cell phones. People are switching out their cell phones. Maybe they're requesting a new cell phone on their holiday wish list. So you, what happens is we end up with these old ones. You've got a great idea for what we can do with all those old cell phones sitting in the drawer collecting dust. Can you tell us about cell phones for soldiers? Yeah, thank you. Um, with uh, all the new phones coming out every day, every day pretty much every day, um, <laughs> People get the old cell phones, and they, what do you do with them? Mm -hmm. And there's an organization, a uh, tax deductible organization, that will take them. Uh, they recycle them in an eco-friendly manner. And then for every phone they get, it's a $5 gift card that, uh, that's good for phone calls, and it's sent to the soldiers overseas. Well, and we think when you look at the history of this, it was started by a couple of kids in 2004. It's really an amazing story if you go online and look at what these kids did. They had uh, a soldier come home and had so much, so many phone bills that you know, so much amount that they've been. In order to call home, it cost them thousands of dollars, and they just were thought that was shocking that a soldier working on our behalf would have to pay so much just to stay in contact. It's such a valuable, valuable thing this program does. It is. Uh you know, for a five-dollar uh, phone card, they get two and a half hours of talk time. Think of you know two and a half hours. You know, they can call their mom and say everything's fine. Go check on their kid. You know, th th things like that. It is such a beautiful thing that they can do. Um, it is just it's just overwhelming how nice it is. Yeah, and and this organization, it, uh, it's gotten a lot of awards. The children were like. 12 and 14 or something when they started it they've gotten awards there's a lot of corporate sponsors that have signed on my my statistics say is it like over 300 million minutes of talk time they've been able to get give away it's like incredible and all being used because we've got people serving all over that's true uh, that's about the right figures mm -hmm. um, figure every phone that they get if it's five dollars that's mm -hmm. that's a lot of money a lot of talk time that they can get uh, myself since I took it over in May. I've sent uh, 140 phones to them. And think about that, that soldiers who can keep in touch with their families. And you said, it, you were very clear, they'll take old phones. They don't have to be working phones. They don't have to be the new phones. But you do have a suggestion that you'd like people to kind of prepare your phone so that you have a little safety from identity theft. Yeah. Uh, to protect yourself, it's always best to restore it to factory settings. Um, every phone will have that. If you don't know how it is, I'm sure your cell phone company will be able to tell you that. And then once you've done that, take out any SIM card or any uh, memory card that you have in there. Uh, yes, they'll probably do this stuff too, mm -hmm. but you don't want to be the one that falls through the cracks. Yeah, exactly. So it's just in, we've got a SIM card here. They're just, like you said, you can go to your vendor and they'll help you figure out how to get that out. Um, you hit that restore to factory settings and it's all good to go. That's the button you never want to hit until you're ready to go to cell phones for soldiers. They'll take some other things too. They'll take iPads and tablets and MP3 players and all kinds of things you might have in your drawer. Yeah, that's, that's correct. They, I mean, they'll take anything electrical okay. like that. I mean, they won't take remote controls, stuff yeah. like that, but um, iPads, yeah. iPods, whatever you have, they'll take it. It's, and, and like you said, they're, they're recycling and they're doing it very environmentally friendly too because that end of the project, you don't want something like this going in the landfill or something like this. The recyclers that they work with are taking care of things. Oh, that's, that's right. They'll, they'll take care of it all for you. Um, I mean, if you're going to give away your phone or you know, throw away your phone, it's not going to go into a good place. Mm -hmm. Give it to a good place. Oh, this is a great place. And what makes it even easier is you're doing all the work. You're bundling it up, shipping it where it's got to go. You're making it super easy for us because you've got four, you've got drop boxes in three locations, I guess, around town, including here 24-7 at uh, the police station. Uh, correct. I have uh, three of them set up. One here, uh, we're open 24 hours a day. One at Public Works, which is open 7 to 3. 
and one at uh, the Village Hall, which is open 9 to 5. Uh, at each one, I also have, they have a tax deduction form that you can pick one up and uh, write it off on your taxes. Oh, wow. So you got like double bonus there. It's a, well, it's a, so it's something that you're not going to just have it out up till the end of December, right? This box is going to be available for a little while as we're going through our drawers? No, oh, it's going to be there as long as the program is there. Excellent. Well, and the program is going strong. It's a really well-respected program. Thank you for taking the time to do all the, the legwork on it. So all we have to do is drop off our stuff and make a difference. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, I was just recently looking to maybe buy a new phone. I looked online. I'm like, oh, okay, what, are they, uh, what would they give me for mine? $10. Really? $10? I'd rather give it to so some yeah. soldier that can yeah. call home and checking our kids or something. Exactly. You know it's going to a good place. And when you talk about um, good work going on here, you get involved in all those programs as the community service officer. Yes. But we've got to, when you look out here in the entryway, you've got some other things going on too that people can donate to, one of them being Toys for Tots coming up. Yeah, the U.S. Marine Corps always uh, sets up uh, Toys for Tots boxes. Um, we have them here in the lobby, again, 24 hours a day. Somebody wants to come in, bring a new uh, unwrapped toy. And they will uh, they will gladly accept it and give it to a, a needy child. Yeah, and the key is new and unwrapped. And the the, the Marine Corps reserves do have some. Um, they don't want anything that looks like toy weapons or anything that just that just goes with their philosophy of what they're doing. But otherwise, new, unwrapped, any kind of toy. And I think that collection. I think the Marines will come by, I believe, on Thursday, December 14th. So you do have to. We kind of have to hurry on that one a little bit. But uh, we've got time up till, till the 14th. That's and another thing you've got going on out there, you've got another box out there for, for coats for vets. Can you say a couple words about that? Yeah, we're uh, collecting coats, and uh, new coats are better. We'll take some gently used coats, and we uh, send them up to the veteran Veterans Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a great thing for them. Uh, Officer, uh, Officer Blau is here for it, and she was one that take care of it. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, it's another thing I think we forget the need, we don't always see it right in front of us, but there is a tremendous need from our veterans who are coming back and you're, you're helping them in a lot of ways, but a winter coat is huge right now. So. It is, I mean, that they might not have everything that they can get, mm -hmm. so give them something that's gonna keep them warm. Yeah. And, and like you said, if a, a almost new, gently used coat, if you've just got it hanging in your closet and it's in your way, there's a vet that can use it. So. Yeah, it's better than going to a landfill too. Mm -hmm. So that's the things you can do over here at in the entryway. And I, well, I think we should remind people, too, there's two uh, police department buildings. The brown brick building southeast is the one where you can get in and get stuff done. Yeah, there's there's signs out there that say uh, which, which one is the police entrance. Yeah. So there are... Well, for old timers who've been around t for a long time like me, we have habits and we go to the wrong building, so it's the brown one. So, but uh, these boxes will be out here all the time, or go to Village Hall, go to Public Works. You've got more information. I know one place you can go online to vhpd.com. There's a lot of information there. Look up the cell phones for soldier program, so you'll find out how great it is. Or you're available. You can people can email you all the time. Oh, absolutely, they can email me and go to the cell phones for soldier site. Um, even if you like, they, they will take donations online from you. We will not take them, but uh, they will take donations of anything. Excellent. Well, a lot of good things you're doing over here. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for doing all the legwork. So all we have to do is drop stuff off. That's pretty awesome. Well, thank you. <laughs> and thank you. And everybody, remember, if you've got questions, check in with Officer Pulaski. Um, but check through your stuff. Let's make sure everything goes to good use. So thank you very much, and uh, happy holidays, too. Thank you. You, too. Happy holidays. I'm Kim Christensen with the Vernon Hills Police Department's Crime Prevention Unit. By the time you see this, the holiday shopping season will be in full swing. And I don't know about you, but I don't know where 2017 went. It seems like just yesterday we were planning the uh, law enforcement exhibition at Hawthorne Mall, and a month before that we were planning National Night Out, and here we are, the holiday season. In a couple days, Santa Claus is going to be over my right shoulder here. Actually, I won't be here, but he'll be sitting right here was behind my shoulder. However, let's take a few minutes now to, to go over some tips and some suggestions to help keep your money, your vehicle, and your home safe during this holiday season. 
First, let's deal with the topic of parking, parking your vehicle. Even though you're not in the roadway, please don't use your cell phone driving through a parking lot. Watch for pedestrians in the lots that are talking and texting. We all see them from time to time as you're walking in front of a store. People walking in front of you from the parking lot into the store, into the shopping center, and you see them looking down, texting into their phone. Please keep an eye out for those people. Other tips for your vehicle, close the windows and lock it up, even if you're only going to be inside for a minute. Hide small valuables, even seemingly inexpensive ones, because even those items can be a temptation for a thief. Put larger items in the trunk. Shopping bags sitting in the back seat, or on the front seat for that matter, well, those are a dead giveaway to a thief. Try to park in well-lit areas. And think about that when you're parking during the day and you're not going to be coming out at night. Okay, so you've parked your vehicle, your car, your truck, whatever, in the parking lot, and you are ready to go shopping or you're ready to go dining, whether you're inside Hawthorne Center, where we are right now, or any place else. If you carry a purse, please keep it close to you and keep it in front of you where you can see it. And keep it closed. Cover the clasp or the flap with your hand or your forearm. Never carry open purses or open bags. Those are just an easy target for a pickpocket or a thief. Now, men, try to carry your wallet in an inside coat pocket or side pants pocket. Don't put them in the, try, to, try not to use that rear pants pocket that we're all used to, because that's, again, Good pickpockets, that's an easy target. Now everyone, please don't overburden yourself. It's awfully hard to keep track of your purse and other belongings and hard to react when you're loaded down. Now for shopping, this is extremely important. If you're in a busy restaurant or, or any restaurant for that matter, try to avoid hanging your purse over the chair at the restaurant. Busy restaurants, that can be a target. And as much as humanly possible, stay alert. Is it cold in here or is it me? Well, we've covered when you're shopping, physically shopping in a shopping center or any store for that matter, but more and more people are doing their shopping online. In fact, statistically, I read that in 2016, during November and December of 2016, $63.1 billion was spent on e-commerce. That is absolutely amazing. It's more than the $53.3 billion that was spent two years earlier in 2014. So, when you're shopping online, try to shop on secure sites. And when you're doing your checkout, look for the HTTPS in the address, not just HTTP, because the S stands for secure. When you're online, try to use your credit card, not your debit card. There's better protection in the event of fraud, and there's less access to your other accounts as well. Monitor your monthly statements and notify your charge card company immediately if you see any transaction that looks suspicious, unusual, or one that you don't remember. For additional, there's great information from the American Bar Association at www.safeshopping.org. And you can also visit the Federal Trade Commission website at consumer.ftc. Gov. Okay, so you're done your shopping, you've done your eating. Let's talk about your home security because keeping your home safe and secure is important 12 months a year. Holidays are busy, holidays are hectic. So let's take some extra precautions now. While you're out, leave lights on or a radio and something that makes it look and sounds like someone is home. Timers are pretty inexpensive and everyone should have at least one, preferably two, one on each floor. Take an extra minute to make certain that the doors and windows are closed and locked and take an extra look at that overhead garage door. Weather and cold could affect it closing properly. Are you going away for the holidays? Well, if so, ask a friend or relative to keep an eye on your home and Again, make it look lived in, such as, has a, has a snowfall recently? Have your neighbor clean up that snow. We want to make the house look lived in. Stop your mail and your newspapers or have someone pick them up. Ask your neighbor, your friend to rearrange the curtains once in a while. Move the car in and out of the garage once in a while. Again, use those timers. 
you know, please, please, and you've heard this before, but it is so true, please don't advertise on social media that you're going away. Finally, call the police department. In Vernon Hills, call 847-362-4449 and follow the prompts and you can request a home vacation watch while you're away. A few seconds ago, I mentioned that nasty S word, snow. And while we're on the topic of it, let's talk about this. If you're watching this, you probably reside in Vernon Hills. Like most communities, a Vernon Hills Village Ordinance prohibits parking on a village street for 12 hours after a two inch snowfall. And while this may serve as a minor inconvenience to some, it is necessary so that the plows can do a thorough job of cleaning the streets without having to go back a second and third time. So we appreciate your cooperation with that. This is rather comfortable. I don't think Santa will mind if I sit in his sleigh for a couple of minutes. Something that the police department want to share with you is we just started a new way that you can request permission to park your vehicles on the street overnight. It's really pretty simple. You can do it online now. You can also do it over the phone, but you can do it online. And probably the easiest thing to do is go to the village's website and at the top it says, how do I Mouse over that, and then one of the choices that will pop up is requesting overnight parking permission, and it will take it from there. If you have any questions, you can still visit our website for other information about it, or you can call. Well, that should just about do it for this safety segment of Vernon Hills Update. We do want to thank everybody at Hawthorne Center for their assistance and cooperation in allowing us to come in here and, and tape these tips for you. On behalf of Chief Patrick Kreese and everybody at the Vernon Hills Police Department, we want to wish you a happy and safe holiday season, and we're going to see you again in 2018. We are here at Countryside Fire in the break room. I'm with Fireman Tony. It's that kind of day, so we're having a hot cup of cocoa, and we're here to talk about holiday safety, because as we're going into December, so many people gathering together, a lot of decorations going up, a lot of things happening, and that makes firemen like Fireman Tony, Tony a little nervous. There's a lot that can happen. So thanks for taking the time to remind us again of these important messages. Oh, my pleasure. And it's always nice to have somebody come on over and share a, share a hot, hot cup of cocoa with you, Lynn. There you go. And it's a beautiful table, too. We'll show you pictures of that in a second. So well, let's talk about decorations, because as people are coming into December, and I know we've heard it before, but it bears repeating. It's so important how you put your electric lights up. You can't over, overdo a circuit. You can't have snakes and octopuses of wires all over. We don't want a daisy chain, as is referred to. One power strip, and then you're appliance plugged into that, not plugging in a power strip to power strip or extension cord and power strips. We don't like using extension cords, power strips directly to those appliances or to those holiday lights. Yeah. And those power strips, they've got those surge protectors in there too, so if something goes bad, it turns everything off. Yes, the power strips with the surge protectors are the way to go. There are older ones out there, so if yours is older than 10 years old, it's probably a good good time to replace it. Well, let's talk about lights, too. Nowadays, the lights don't get as hot. Even lights from 10, 15 years ago, you know, the wires get a little hard, they get a little brittle, and those light bulbs get hotter. Nowadays, you can find them, and they, the LEDs are cooler burning. They are cooler burning and brighter, but we still want to make sure we're, the, we're using the power strips with the, with the surge protectors, and we're checking for loose bulbs, we're checking for broken bulbs or missing bulbs, and making sure it's UL protected, underwriter laboratory protected. Okay, that's that little tag that's on stuff. So, well, and you've told me before, too, like don't throw a rug over your wires to, That's because you don't want people moving across them. Yes, that's going to cause a little friction, and it's going to make it harder for electricity to flow, and that's how fires have started. When we talk about fires, too, I mean, it's a serious situation. Um, nowadays, our houses have so much more flammable material than they did 25, 30 years ago. I and mean, so I know that's why you're so worried. Yeah, it's actually referred to as modern versus legacy. Legacy being the older, more organic 
products, uh, wool and, and cotton. Now we have the synthetics and the plastics and the polyesters, and those do burn hotter and faster and are more poisonous. We gotta be careful, we gotta be careful. And another thing I know, we've, we've talked now about like lights and things like that. People have a holiday tree, um, keep it watered, but I know you, you, I, you've told me before, sometimes like the artificial are more safe than the, than the real one. Well, for traditional folks out there, like myself, when you cut that tree, you definitely just gotta keep it watered. And one thing, like watering your dog, watering your pets, water it in the morning, Water in the afternoon, water in the evening, just like yourself when you get a glass of water. It's not just once a day. So look after it. Keep it away from a heat source. It'll tend to not dry out as soon. We, we, we know that they do dry out, but they will last if you properly water them and keep them away from those heat sources. What I know, another thing, your candles are your thing, and you've got a saying about blowing them out. When you go, I'll blow them out. Yes, we were talking about that in the schools, coincidentally, this week, and we want to make sure when you go to sleep, when you leave a certain part of the house, when you leave the house itself and you have candles burning, blow them out. Leaving candles burning unattended is one of the leading causes of accidental fires. Well, that even means like if I go from the kitchen and they're on the table in the kitchen and I've retired to the living room, I should not, even though I'm close by. Absolutely. I, I have no other way of saying it. When you go out, blow it out. And I know you like those faux candles, too. Well, there's battery-operated candles, the flameless candles. They give the little flickering look and, and, the, and the look of a live candle. So, and, and, and they're safer that way in terms of if you forget to leave them on, if you forget to blow them out. Because we do tend to forget. That's the thing. That's why, we, that's why we come back every holiday season and talk about these things, because we just have to have it in the top of our mind to make sure we're safe. And when we talk about being safe like that, we, we've... You're going to have the wreath out for Keep the Wreath Red. Let's remind people uh, about what Keep the Wreath Red is. Uh, Keep the Wreath Red is about making sure we don't have any fires caused by the holiday lights. And when you drive by the fire station, you'll see our big wreath out on the fire station with red lights. Keep the wreath red. If you see a white light in there, that means there was a fire caused by holiday lights. So we're asking you, check your holiday lights, check your holiday decorations, making sure that they're all safe and prevent those fires. Excellent. We will keep the wreath red, we promise for that. So, Well, and another thing that's happening too is over December, as the kids get out of school and they're, they're sitting around, they may be watching um, you, Fireman Tony. You've taught kids a lot of things, but have you got a couple assignments that you could give kids or activities they could do over the holiday time, you know, so like they know how to be safe in their home? Absolutely. Let's start off with reminding mom and dad to check the smoke alarms. Test them monthly. I know we talk about it and some of you guys run home and tell mom and dad and it gets done, but then again we tend to slip away from that habit. So we want to develop that habit. Let's test the smoke alarms here in December and keep it going for the year 2018. Also, Test your carbon monoxide alarm. Most of us have gas appliances, natural gas appliances, and or an attached garage and have carbon mo monoxide alarms. Test that as well monthly. And lastly, I know we've talked about having escape plans. Make an escape plan with your family and practice it. I know it's winter time, but find the time, test the smoke alarm, get outside to your meeting place, practice that fire escape plan, have a drill and you'll always remember what to do and where to go. It's all about repetition. That's why we repeat all these things. We just have to keep remembering them so we stay safe. So thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Thank you for all you do in the schools because that's, that's key. It's when our kids know what to do that keeps the whole house safe. So thank you for that. And, and all, to all of you over here at Countryside Fire, thank you for taking care of us and happy holidays. Thank you very much, Lynn. And on behalf of Countryside Fire Protection District, have a safe and happy holiday season.
Okay, everybody, it's dark out here, so we probably need to get this going, right? The queens are all here. Why don't you girls, who's the youngest? I can tell. You, what's, you, well, I know your name, but what you say your name, please. Little Miss Vernon Hills. Leah Cleek. Leah Cleek. Let's give her a hand. Linnea. Okay, Linnea, tell everybody your last name. This is Miss Preteen Vernon Hills. Hi, I'm Linnea Gutierrez. Miss Vernon Hills. What's that? It's Preteen Miss. Yeah, okay, everybody give her a hand, would you please? All right. Next we have uh, somebody I know because she was born in the house next door on Greenvale. So, Madison. Hi, I'm Madison Trillo. What's your title? I'm Junior Miss Vernon Hills. All right, let's give Madison a big applause. I saw her when she was little. Yeah. Do you know this guy out here? Who is he? Um, he's someone that comes over. All right, God bless you. Yeah, and, and so in essence, now we have Brianna and Brianna. I'm Brianna Blatt and Miss Vernon Hills 2017. Let's give Brianna a hand. Okay. Does anybody else want to add anything? No? You want to say something? <laughs> Look at it, chatty. <laughs> no? <laughs> Nothing? <laughs> All right. You want, want us to light the tree then? We're not just lighting the tree. Obviously, we're lighting the menorah. And uh, I just want to wish everybody, uh, those that uh, celebrate Kwanzaa, I know we have uh, a, a, a sizable Indian uh, population in town. And it's uh, uh, Diwali, the Festival of Lights. Uh, and then there's... Uh, <laughs> Then, then there's Hanukkah, and then there's Christmas. So I wish everybody ha happy holidays and a healthy and prosperous New Year. And uh, somebody take the mic and let's do the countdown, okay? You do it? Put it by your mouth. Go ahead. Ten. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. On behalf of the Village of Vernon Hills, including Village President Roger Byrne and the Board of Trustees and all the Village staff, have a happy and safe holiday season. Thank you for tuning in to the Vernon Hills Update.